Welcome to Wisła in Poland. We're here at the annual conference of the European Leadership Forum, which is a coalition of evangelical groups seeking to do what no single organization could do alone, provide a bridge between God's global resources and local leaders from all over Europe. I'm joined by Glyn Harrison, Emeritus Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Bristol in the UK, where he was a practicing consultant psychiatrist and chair of the Department of Psychiatry. He preaches locally and speaks widely on issues of faith and psychology, neuroscience and psychiatry. He is especially focused on supporting men's ministries and fostering the development of Christian leaders and pastors. Glenn is speaking at this conference on how self-esteem ideology invaded our lives and uh, wants your heart and biblical self-compassion. Welcome, Glyn, to the studio. Thanks, Tim. And how has self-esteem ideology invaded our lives? Um, well, without our, without our knowing it, I think, uh, it's crept in. And uh, I think it was Norman Vincent Peale, 1952, with his power of positive thinking, in some ways laid, laid the foundation for uh, a developing emphasis on uh, valuing putting the self at the center of our life's project, you know, how I feel about myself, feeling good about myself. So um, there's a, there a survey in Canada not long ago, uh, you know, I'm lovable, I'm special, I'm perfect in every way, I'm strong. Those are the kind of statements. They discovered that uh, nearly 50% of people would say, I use at least from time to time. And only 3% of people say, I, I never use statements like that. So there's been a big sort of, shift in society toward thinking that rehearsing the positive about myself, massaging it, nourishing it, is, is like feeding the soul. You know, it's a good thing. And uh, the extent to which that thinking has invaded our lives and the church is uh, quite remarkable. I, I mean, I saw a, a church website not long ago. Uh, the strap line was, you're incredible we're here to celebrate you, which is um, an extraordinary turnaround, if, if you think, from the gospel, uh, in that here it's saying, you're brilliant, and we have stuff here that we can bring to you that makes you better still. And if you contrast that with Jesus, who says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, which is, you're not as good as you think you are, but there's something here into which you can come uh, which is life eternal, but it's bigger than you. So it's, it's, it's about being part of something bigger than you rather than keeping you at the center. And that is a fundamental difference between self, the gospel of self-esteem and, and the Christian gospel of grace. So um, just addressing it on, uh, in two spheres, let's say, in the sphere of, of our culture where there's been so much brokenness, it seems as though it's being applied to try and, mm. you know, beef people up and give them some sense of, um, you know, self-worth. Uh, but in the church, is, could it be a, a reaction to what has been seen as a sort of the, the church being slightly too negative uh, mm. in terms of self-denial? Yeah, I, I mean, it's a really great point because so much of human history and, and church history is, is a lurch from one extreme to another and certainly you it's a great point that f you know having a down on yourself uh, nurturing fostering ideas of self negation you know that you're nothing is not good for us um, and and it's certainly not what the gospel calls us into and there's no doubt that that we we have overdone this in the past and forgotten something of the glory of being made in the image of God and the dignity that that gives us. But even within the gospel, that isn't put at the, at the center of the gospel. It's the glory of God that comes at the center of the gospel. And our sense of dignity comes almost as a byproduct of serving that vision. And I think that's always the difference. The, the question is, what are you putting at the center of your life project? What are you living for? What's motivating you? And if feeling good about myself is the, is the answer to that, 
you're going down a cul-de-sac. And I, I think that's what the psychological evidence is now showing. It is a cul-de-sac. And certainly the, the Christian gospel cuts right across that kind of project. And um, just looking again at society, that you know, there, there is this um, veneer of entertainment and feel-good factor, which is, which is very shallow, mm. um, but very popular. Mm. <laughs> so, so how do you break into that with a deeper message? Yeah, I mean, I mean we, we are ensnared in a powerful cultural you know, a zeitgeist which does put the, the self at the center. You know, uh, right in popular culture, you know, Whitney Houston's song, What's the Greatest Love? The Greatest Love of All is to learn to love yourself. Um, and, uh, the, you know, I, I saw an interview with a, an American celebrity and they asked her to make her confess her greatest sin. And she thought, and, um, you know, it's in a, in a celebrity magazine thing, but she, she, she thought, she said, you know, my greatest sin, I think, is that I've never loved myself. And that's, in, in this upside down world, you don't take pride into the confessional. It's that you didn't love yourself enough. That's almost the new sin. And, and you see this in schools where we mustn't allow our kids to fail because that would damage this fragile self-esteem that's so important to protect. So what we're doing is nurturing children who are not resilient to life's knocks because they are going to fail. Uh, we're developing a kind of a therapeutic education which is more about protecting children's fragile mental health in a slightly anxious, overprotective way, rather than creating a generation of robust learners who want to know everything about the world and know that you've got to learn to fail well, as well as you know, serve other people well. And those are some of the ways in our schools, in our churches, in our culture that self-esteem ideology, I think, has over 50 years turned things around. Is there a case for saying that those who are um, uh, go-getters, ambitious, successful, they need the message to tone it down and, and to, to be more self-effacing. And, and those who, who suffer from the, the low self-esteem, they need a message to encourage them. It's a really interesting question. You, you, you know, do those who, who, who have an over in, who are driven by a desire to be more, do they need to tone it down and those who are less to, to inflate up? I, both of those are wrong, actually, because the problem with that answer is that, it, is, is that you're still looking in the wrong place. Um, you, you, you're still looking in, in a place that has, what is my value at the center of the life's project. It, still, it makes it too important. And what the Christian gospel does is it says, this is not unimportant what our significance is. It, of course it's important. And it has spin-offs in terms of confidence and gifting and purpose and how we live our lives. But it cannot be the center. It's just one part of a broader picture which we think of now as our identity. It, God leads us to a different place. And he says, let's get your identity right, and then within that, resolve some of these questions of, you know, if you're a driven executive, and you know in your heart, deep in your heart, that you are deeply insecure, and, that, and much of this is being driven by a need to prove something, maybe to your dad, maybe to yourself. Um, that's something to be dealt with, but, but, but it isn't, how can I do myself down? It's how can I think about myself differently now that I'm God's son called to his work? See, that's a different yeah. way of looking. It, 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 it's a mindset issue. It's about changing your mindset from one in which the big project isn't what's good for me to the big project being what's good for the kingdom of God. And if you remember, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God, all these things will be yours as well. Those kind of um, feelings of, of worth actually partly then follow as a, a byproduct of the pursuit of something bigger than, than ourselves. Uh, in in, in this, this process of 
getting it right, as it were, um, how important is it to, to at least know yourself, mm. to uh, sort of understand who, mm. who you are, mm. um, leaving aside how you deal with that, but to actually know where you are? I mean, that, in a way, is the starting point. Uh, we we, we want to keep a balance. We, we, we don't want self-absorbed Christians who, uh, again, make the, the project me, you know. We don't, but neither do we want Christians who are not self-aware. And I, I you, you know, we, we all have an unknown side to ourselves that we can't see, a blind self, if you like. We can't see it, but other people can. Um, and... Uh, you know, in terms of understanding our heart, we do need really quality friendships, quality relationships in which we can keep growing, keep understanding, keep getting feedback, keep changing. So I think self-awareness is, is an important part of, of that. In going back to the, to the culture in which we live in society, I, I'm <coughs> slightly biased in my questions to the UK because that's where I come yeah. from. But the... Um, that it seems that with the brokenness of the family and family breakdown, a whole industry has sprung up, you know, government funded, commissioned by councils to, mm. to sort of provide, you know, the infill, you know, with some of this self-esteem type, you know, mm. uh, how, how would you advise, um, let's say, the government to address this problem? Mm. You know, families have broken down, now we're trying to reconstruct something in society. Yeah, and, and, and the question is, is self-esteem going to plug yeah. some of the holes that are left by that scale of breakdown? And it's a, it's a pipe dream that, that, that you can do that. Because you can't separate out questions of, of worth from those bigger questions of, of identity and meaning. You, you know, if, if, if you say to somebody... Um, look, um, how about reframing it so that it's not what's good for me, it's what's good for other people as well, as well as me. You see, if you try to reframe someone, and you can either say that psychologists are beginning to show that having that mindset, a more outward-looking mindset, is actually healthier and leaves us feeling better. If you try to convince them along those lines, still if someone comes back to you and says, well, that sounds good, putting other people... But why should I? You, you know, what psychology has no answer to that. These are deeply philosophical and theological issues. And so when we go looking for simple psychological solutions to major social and ultimately spiritual issues, uh, th we're not going to plug that gap. Having said that, there are different approaches within a secular framework that you can use. And increasingly now, schools are seeing that self-esteem programs are not produced. There's no evidence they're producing the hoped for outcomes. There's no evidence they improve educational outcome or that they reduce long-term mental health problems. No evidence. In fact, there's accumulating evidence they may make things worse. Schools are beginning to understand this and move to two, two new developments. One is resilience programs, and that's simply teaching children to, to bounce back, how to fail, how to be tougher, um, how to control their thinking and their emotions better, without getting in, snagged up too much in this question of self-worth. So it's trying to shift the focus. And actually, I, I think there's a lot there that Christians would be very happy for their kids to be part of, you know? Um, and the other very interesting development is character. The, there's a, a trial on in, in Great Britain at the moment in a, in a series of schools looking at trying to teach character. Now, of course, those of us who are Christians would say that's a deeply philosophical and, again, theological or spiritual question. What, what is character? So there are real opportunities for Christians to speak into this from the Christian worldview as to what we understand by character and how, how in a sense, pleased we are that, that the fruits of the gospel, fruits of the spirit, you, you know, are seen and recognized in society as essentially being good for us, 
And I, 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 th I think that's quite pleasing to mm. see that all truth is God's truth and, and in the end we, we come to see the truth of it. Yeah. So. Um, just following that theme, the, do you, you say, say you're hopeful there's some change. It seems that from the 1960s onwards, certainly and again in our country, there have, um, there's been this sort of throwing off the shackles of, of, a, of a negative religion, let's say, yeah. uh, and, and could it be now that the pendulum has swung you know, to the extreme of, let's say, moral liberalism to, to actually people become more serious, especially with the economic downturn, and, and come back to say, right, we have to become more sensible about yeah, uh, but pendulums do tend to swing back. We are made in the image of God. You, you know, th there is something even within the secular spirit, the secular mind, which, which can see evil and see the potential for escalating evil. And, and something within our, within our being made in the image of God that can pull that and rescue it. Uh, and one, one, would, one would hope for that. Certainly, um, our churches... Sometimes I, I worry we're almost ju just catching up with where we were in the 80s and 90s with a spirit of entitlement, you know, self-denial. That uh, When I was a kid, self-denial was quite an important part of being a, a Christian. And uh, you don't hear so much talk about self-denial in our current culture. Uh, and I, I, I think it may be that culture is beginning to think about the, the merits of the virtues of some of these things again, maybe perhaps even ahead of us, you know. But but I think the reassuring thing for us is the message: the gospel is good news. And once again, as we as we're, as we're looking at the way our culture is going, we're seeing that it, it's discovering that some of those fundamental facets of of the gospel, you, you know, that character is important. That God loves to see the fruit of the spirit formation of His Son and. Um, you know, essentially it's good for us and, and we need to recover our confidence that this is good for our kids, it's good for our own hearts to walk in the way of, of the gospel. Just um, going to another passage in the scriptures in Philippians 2, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, yes. um, but have the yeah. mind of Christ. Could you expand on that? Well, um, y y y that's a really nice text for, for suggest, you know, for challenging where your main road is in life, what, what's the motivating factor that gets you out of bed in the morning? What makes you tick? I often ask patients, or, you know, at the end of the day, what, what sort of makes you tick? What's the thing? And he's saying, do nothing out of, out of you know, conceit and ambition, which uh, essentially, conceit is about standing out, being noticed, being above. Ambition is about standing out for your achievements, for what you, you get, being above, being in front. And don't, don't let that be the main road. Don't let that be the motivating force, but instead have the mind of Christ. And of course, the mind of Christ is a servant-hearted, a servant-hearted mind that yet in serving, I think the, the genius of the gospel is that when, when you lose yourself, you find yourself. The, the, I think it's almost a divine trick that uh, when you give yourself up, you find you had more than ever you knew. And that's one of the wonderful features of the gospel. And in that passage as well, it, it, has, it says, look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. True. So um, just coming back to the theme, uh, Self-esteem ideology. Could you just literally outline what that is? This, what, uh, what you consider to be the self-esteem ideology? Well, s simply, the, the ideology is that um, valuing yourself, making the pursuit of self-worth or love of self the core project of your life brings untold happiness and secures or protects you against a raft of life's adversities. That's the, that's the pill, that, that's what's on offer. And I, I think I'm trying to say it's quack medicine. And who've, who's been most affected by this? What generation, you know, old, young, 
um, or what era has been most affected by this? Well, uh, yes, uh, it's, uh, it's, I think that's a hard question to ask. I, c I couldn't produce evidence, you, you know, offhand, um, but, but it certainly started, of course, in the younger generation. Uh, I, and, and yet, um, the baby boomers were the first to be affected by my generation. Uh, in the 60s, people who entered teenager years in the 60s. Um, and then we have now worked our way through to our 60s. And uh, I'm a poor, you know, the rate of marital breakdown in my generation, sense of entitlement. Um, so I think one can say now that it affects all age ranges because, again, let's keep this in proportion. There's a load of, a lot of kids out there have a real heart. You know, there are kids who, who do some wonderful work for others. So we don't want to overdo this, but there's no doubt that the general shift has happened. In fact, the Henley Forecasting Institute in England has tracking data on what people see as the priority for making a good society. And the question is, I, I can't remember the exact word, but the question is something like, what makes for a good society? Is it putting others first as well as yourself, or is it meeting your own needs first and then others? And until the turn of the millennium, most people put others first. They felt that was the right thing to put, whether they did or not. But they felt that was the right, that was the culture, that was the right answer. But just on the year 2000, it changed. The majority went into myself first, and then it's risen again since then. So there's quite a lot of tracking data showing that we're much more ready to endorse um, the importance of self at the centre. Um, we've mentioned knowing yourself. Um, there's, there's an element, again, from the scriptures of, you know, love is patience, and then it goes and it says, it mentions self-control. Mm. How, how, how does this fit in? Well, th that's a really good, good point. I, I, I'd say that self-control is part of a proper self-management, a proper compassion toward oneself as one seeks to grow in the Lord. And, and one of the things that you do because you want to work with the grain of what God's doing in, in your life as you discipline, govern, govern your heart, guard your heart, is control yourself. Keep an eye on um, our human capacity, the capacity of our heart to do damage to other people, to ourselves, to be deceitful. Um, and uh, if, you know, I was talking about resilience earlier, interestingly, in in schools, in secular settings, the teaching of self-control is also coming up now as one of the new interesting developments. Mm -hmm. Because uh, there's really quite good evidence now that children, particularly infants in preschool age, um, who learn good self-control, that is a better predictor of longer-term educational outcomes even than IQ. It's certainly as good as IQ. It may even be better. So l by self-control, I'm meaning learning to put off an, a desire for immediate gratification to achieve longer-term goals. That kind of self-control. There's a lot of interest in that at the moment. And of course, that's part of the gospel picture of self-control. We deny ourselves. But we also know that there's something greater to, to work for. And there's, an emer there's quite a lot of emerging psycho psychological evidence showing the benefits of self-control. So many psych psychologists like Roy Blaumeister, a big expert, having reviewed all of the data, would say we need to be talking less about self-esteem and more about self-control with our, with our children. Very interesting. Mm. Last question, just lifting us out of ourselves completely. How, for Christians, how important is it to have an appreciation of God's presence, you know, through each day, through each challenge, um, to counterbalance this um, tendency towards introversion? Yeah, it's, it's, a it's a complicated question, that. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's a complex question because, of course, w there are such a range of personality types, and some of us sense, in an emotional sense, God's presence more easily than others and or more accessible to that sense of 
feeling the presence of God, whereas others, um, you know, like to think the presence of God in, in a way that, for them, secures their discipleship just as much. You know, it orientates them outside themselves. So, um, you know, a regular practicing of the presence of God has to be one of the key elements of helping us in this long, slow discipleship of shifting from a focus on me to a focus on the glory of God. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Glyn. And thank you also to you, our audience, and to remind you that you can see the answers to these questions on the website, focalonline.org, F-O-C-L, online.org. Goodbye.